William and Kate on their first official visit to Pakistan. It's the first royal visit to the country in 13 years. This is a couple the international crowd still want to see. This week, William and Kate toured Pakistan. The Queen opened Parliament. I pray that the blessing of Almighty God may rest upon your councils. And Harry got emotional about fatherhood. Last year, when my wife and I attended, we knew we were expecting our first child. Um, no one else did at the time, but we did. And I remember... <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Royal Report. I'm your host, Sharon Carpenter, and this is my trusty sidekick, Lady Breadloaf. Say hello, girl. She is super excited to be here. Joining us today is People's Senior News Editor Erin Hill, who's also excited Hi. to be here, I hope. Yes. Great to see you, Erin. You. You've been a busy woman. It's been a crazy busy past week. week, hasn't it? Yes. We're going to chat with you about all of that in just a second. But first, the Royal Week in Review. On Monday, William and Kate received a truly royal welcome when they touched down near Islamabad to kick off their five-day tour of Pakistan. Monday also marked the 65th time Queen Elizabeth has opened the new session of Parliament. While Parliament has been making plenty of Brexit headlines lately, the Queen made news of her own when she chose not to wear the ornate but rather heavy three-pound imperial state crown. I do not blame her one bit. Bath of the neck. On Tuesday, Queen Elizabeth stepped up for a rare joint appearance with Camilla Parker Bowles. The Queen and the Duchess of Cornwall attended the 750th anniversary of the rebuilding of Westminster Abbey. Great to see them together. Doesn't happen very often. Later that evening, Harry and Meghan attended the 2019 Well Child Awards in London. It's a celebration of inspirational children battling serious illnesses, along with the caretakers who have dedicated their lives to helping young people in in need. Truly amazing and inspirational events. Also on Tuesday, William and Kate met with former cricket champion and current Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan. Later that evening, the royal couple made a unique entrance at a reception held in their honour as they arrived in a rickshaw. And what a cool rickshaw it was, the only way to travel from now on. On Wednesday, the Duke and Duchess travelled to the Hindu Kush mountain range to get a first-hand look at how global warming has begun melting the Chiatibo Glacier. Not good. William and Kate also made a poignant stop at the Bad Shahi Mosque today, where they kept with tradition and walked barefoot and in black socks into the iconic Islamic site. And finally today, the couple paid tribute to Princess Diana's humanitarian work with a very special visit to the children's ward at the Shalkat Khanum Memorial Cancer Hospital. More on that later. I don't know about you, Erin, but seeing uh, Will and Kate in the rickshaw, yeah. making their grand entrance. How significant is this mode of transportation? Yeah, I mean, the fact that Will and Kate are incorporating these traditional cultural elements into their tour, like the rickshaw and the traditional clothes they're wearing, these are perfect examples of them using their soft power while they're on these royal tours. And tell us about that, because we hear a lot about soft power when it comes to Will and Kate. What does that mean exactly? Yeah, so these are moments of diplomacy and bridge building between the two nations. Um, the fact that that they are non-political, um, you know, public figures. They are able to have this warming effect on these countries that are in the midst of these geopolitical challenges. That's real power yeah. at the end of the day. That same day, by the way, while touring the Chiatibo Glacier, Prince William spoke about the effects of climate change. Take a look. It's very hard to understand living in an urban environment, where your water comes from and how precious the actual source of it all is. It's really important to come to Pakistan and, and one, again, see all the different range of environments there are in Pakistan and really trying to get a feel of, of, of the country, but also to, to use our voice, to lend our, our position and, and our visit to kind of talk about issues like climate change, issues about the environment. And, and we've seen all around the world now, the young are getting very engaged in what's going on. And I think it's fantastic that we can, can all come together and, and really have a very good conversation about what we need to do. And, and the action needs to happen very soon because a lot of people rely on this. And if we take too long about this, we will lose many of the precious things we care about. 
Yeah, very deep. How well was that speech received? Yeah, I mean, not a lot of people think of Pakistan when they're thinking of global warming and the effects and melting glaciers. Yeah. So this was really special for them to shine a light and not only talk about it, but be there physically to witness it. And then a lot of the villages that have experienced mass flooding due to the melting glaciers and yeah. talking to them and seeing firsthand um, what they've gone through, the loss that they've had. Uh, so it was really uh, important to these villagers and they couldn't, they said it was the best day to have them there talking to them and really being empathetic and wanting to hear about the challenges. Because who even knows that there are glaciers in Pakistan? Exactly. You think of the heat you do. in Pakistan, yeah. don't you? Yeah. All right, let's talk about Will and Kate's visit to the Shaukat Khanna Memorial Cancer Hospital earlier today. The hospital was opened in the 90s and Princess Diana played a major role in helping to raise funds for it in the early years. A very powerful way to help honor Princess Diana's work to help open the hospital over 20 years years ago. William has such a strong connection to the hospital. Why? Yeah, so his mother made two very memorable visits to this hospital in the 90s um, when she was trying to really bring attention to this new research hospital and bring funding there. And she did. And now, um, you know, years later to have Will and Kate there, you know, walking the same hallways, they're actually being shown around by the same doctor that, that showed Diana around is a really wow. amazing moment. Very poignant, yeah. Will and Kate were busy in Pakistan. Harry and Meghan were back in London where they attended the Well Child Awards on Tuesday. Harry gave an emotional speech during the event. Let's take a look. Last year, um, <clears throat> last year when my wife and I attended, we knew we were expecting our first child. Um, no one else did at the time, but we did. And I remember... <laughs> <laughs> And I remember squeezing Megan's hand so tight <clears throat> during the awards. And both of us were thinking what it would be like um, to be parents one day. And more so, what it would be like to do everything we could to protect and help our child, should they be born with immediate challenges or become unwell over time. Wow, that's a wipe a tear it is. for my eye, right? How moving was that to hear Harry talk about Incredible. That, that deep moment? Yeah. I feel like ever since he's become a, a dad, we're seeing this much more personal side of him, yeah. aren't we? And this is such a raw moment that we never see from the royals. We've never seen something like this. So it was yeah. incredibly groundbreaking and really humanized him. And he's been changed since he married Megan and became a dad. And we're seeing that in every event he goes to, especially something like this, and to get such intimate details yeah. about how they, this time last year, they both knew they were expecting, they were keeping it to themselves and how emotional it was for them now. Um, you know, that they are with these kids, they're parents themselves, and they're putting themselves in, in these parents' shoes. You know, if, they're, if Archie one day had to deal with some challenges, um, how they would feel, and it's just the emotion is so incredible. Yeah, well, Erin, I know you need to get back to the newsroom to break more royal news, as you do so well. So we'll let you go. Thank you so much for joining us Thanks. today. We'll see you again very Absolutely. soon. Awesome. Okay, now get out the crumpets, everyone. It's time for Tea Time with Michelle Torber. Hey, Michelle, how are you? Hi, Sharon. I'm great. Thank you so much for having me back. Always great to see you. As People's Senior Royals Editor, you're always on top of the latest rumors brewing across the pond. But today is all about Pakistan, obviously, and more specifically, why Pakistan? Here in the US, when a lot of people think of Pakistan, they probably think of it as the place where we finally found Osama bin Laden. But in the UK, they have a much longer, more complicated history with Pakistan, don't they? They do indeed. Um, Pakistan today is one of the Commonwealth countries, um, which are 53 nations around the world, most of which used to be um, UK territories. And that includes Pakistan, India, of course. Um, Pakistan um, achieved independence in 1947. So um, since then, both, you know, the Britain and Pakistan have maintained close ties. And today there are actually 1.5 million 
people of Pakistani heritage living in Great Britain. So it's an important relationship for both nations. Wow. Well, I just want to read the opening of the official statement announcing this royal tour. Uh, it says, whilst the Duke and Duchess's program will pay respect to the historical relationship between Britain and Pakistan, it will largely focus on showcasing Pakistan as it is today, a dynamic, aspirational and forward-looking nation. So we now know why Pakistan, but why now? What made this the perfect time for the Duke and Duchess to travel to the nation? Yes, well, what we're seeing is more um, sort of diplomacy, higher level diplomacy than we've seen from Kate and William in the past. And I think the answer to the question why now is that this couple is moving ever um, closer to their roles as um, king and queen um, down the road. And we see them really embracing those roles. Um, some people describe Kate and William as having a quote, like soft power. Um, and again, that's sort of a diplomatic power that we see in action here. Um, and we see them really feeling comfortable in those roles on this tour. Yeah, that soft power is, is pretty hard. I know the tour isn't quite over yet, but so far, how well do you think they've been showcasing Pakistan as it is today? I think we have really gotten to see um, this country, Pakistan, in a way, certainly most Americans, um, as you mentioned earlier, are not familiar with Pakistan. You know, they, they know it as Americans know it as sort of a geopolitical hotspot. But what William and Kate have been successful in doing this week is showcasing and using their own, um, you know, sort of media spotlight to show the human side of Pakistan from everything from tourism to local school. You see there um, girls empowerment, which is, is, of course, a very uh, key issue for both William and Kate. Um, we see them in, in uh, a national park. They um, were able to spotlight the issue of climate change, which I think a lot of people aren't aware. Here you can see them in a meeting with the Pakistani president and first lady, um, and here with um, the prime minister and Ron Khan. So they really showcase sort of all these different facets of a country that, again, I think m many Americans certainly um, are really not familiar with. Yeah, getting to see the country in a different light. Uh, yeah. Switching gears now, on Tuesday we saw the Queen and Camilla make news with a rare joint appearance at Westminster Abbey. Why are their joint appearances such a rare thing? You know, they do tend to sort of operate in separate orbits. And in fact, the Queen doesn't do many joint appearances, period, with anyone. Oh, true. Um, but uh, yeah, but what we're seeing from the Queen, who is 93, is she's sort of been doing a little bit more public tutoring, um, mentorship um, of the future Queens, which, um, you know, of course, Camilla, as well as uh, Kate, who she also took on a solo outing, their very first um, earlier this year. Um, Camilla, in case you're wondering, future queen, um, you know, that is, that isn't set in stone, but it's looking more and more like that is, that will be the case. So we see Elizabeth, um, really trying to kind of bring her up. Ah, uh, interesting. How has the queen's relationship with Camilla evolved over the years? Cause we've heard a, a lot of rumors. <laughs> a lot of drama. <laughs> a lot of drama. Camilla. Through the years, yeah, that's that's the uh, one way to put it. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, Camilla um, first entered the scene as Prince Charles's girlfriend, later his very public mistress, um, and ultimately his wife. Um, and you know, as Charles's mother, uh, one can only imagine Elizabeth's thoughts on all of that. Um, we kind of have to imagine because she doesn't do interviews and she doesn't tell anyone her thoughts um, publicly, <laughs> uh, which is probably good, you know, mothering advice to everyone, actually, when you think about it. But um, in any case, I think what we've seen is a greater acceptance of Camilla in this role as future queen. And by the way, that's not just limited to Queen Elizabeth. The public also has shifted that way, which is good news for Charles. Yeah, people have learned to love her. Yes. Now, Michelle, we just heard there's some breaking news in Pakistan, kind of scary. What can you tell us about an electrical storm? Yeah, so it is it is rather scary. In fact, um, what happened was the plane that was carrying Prince William, Princess Kate, and the press corps, um, they had just wrapped a visit to Lahore, um, a mosque there in Pakistan, and they were um, aboard the flight returning to the capital city of Islamabad when they were hit by an electrical storm. Um, and there been, there's been a, a bit of video um, from one of the reporters on the plane show, showing the lightning bolts surrounding the flight. Um, it was sort of, you know, 
tossing and turning up in the sky, which is always a scary scenario to be um, finding yourself in. Um, William uh, showed that he maintained his sense of humor by um, afterward, he after they, they were turned around, went back to Lahore, and William approached the press corps at the back of the plane and said, don't worry, it's all fine. Of course, William himself is an experienced, uh, experienced Royal Air Force pilot. Yeah. Um, but he said, I was the one flying the plane. It's all good. <laughs> well, I know our Simon Perry uh, was on that flight as well. We are trying to reach him. Hopefully, we'll be able to Skype with him live. Obviously, uh, a bit of a frightening situation there. Uh, but hopefully, we'll, we'll get hold of Simon and get that inside information. Really fascinating stuff, Michelle. Thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Thank you, Sharon. All right, we'll see you soon. When we return, People's Chief Foreign Correspondent Simon Perry hopefully joins us via Skype live from Pakistan after that storm. Welcome back, everyone. Now, as we mentioned, our chief foreign correspondent, Simon Perry, is in Pakistan covering the royal tour, and we are trying to get a hold of him live via Skype. He's had a, a few issues, obviously, with a plane having to make a detour and land again because of the weather. He may be on another plane right now. Uh, we'll try to get a hold of him, but in the meantime, we're going to take a look at some of the footage he sent us in person from the week there. OK, take a look at that. That is him flying into Pakistan. He was on the same flight as Will and Kate. Gorgeous views. Nice footage as they're about to arrive. And here they are. Red carpet steps for Will and Kate greeting the locals. Kate's got some flowers there wearing that stunning ombre dress, uh, saying hello to some of the children. And here is the famous rickshaw, brightly colored. Here comes Will, looking very dashing in the uh, traditional Pakistani garb. And there's Kate. Wow, dazzling, absolutely dazzling, picture perfect, the two of them. Wow, well, we weren't able to get a hold of Simon, unfortunately, but we will be catching up with him very soon. OK, we need to take another quick break. But when we return, we'll be breaking down this fabulous week in royal fashion. Welcome back to The Royal Report. I am now joined by People's Senior Style Editor, Brittany Tallarico is here. Brittany, so great to see you looking hot in hot pink. Thank you. I've been inspired by all the color these royals are wearing, oh, so I yeah. thought I'd bring some hot pink. Why not? Bring Love some color. It. Yeah, absolutely. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Hi, Breadloaf. <laughs> <laughs> we are super excited to chat with you, but before we dive deep, let's recap this epically stylish week, shall we? On Monday, Kate stepped off the plane in Aslamabad wearing an aqua blue bespoke dress and matching pants from Catherine Walker. The ombre look featured a gorgeous draped neckline. It was inspired by the national dress of Pakistan. Can't wait to chat about that one, Brittany. On Tuesday, Kate kicked off her first full day of engagements in a periwinkle blue traditional shalwar kameez and dupatta scarf by local designer Mahin Khan. She completed the look with a pair of beige shoes from the brand new look and guess what they're only 24 dollars love that that evening kate attended an event at the pakistan national monument in a sparkling deep emerald column gown by jenny packham absolutely stunning that same day back in the uk megan stepped out for the first time since her africa tour to attend the well child awards in london she also wore green a forest green dress with a bow detail around the waist by perush sadly for us the dress is sold out, boo-hoo, but retailed for around $400. On Wednesday, Kate toured Pakistan's Hindu Kush mountain range in a brown midi skirt and jacket, as well as a waistcoat from British brand Really Wild. Getting kind of wild there with her style. I love it. And finally, back on Monday, the Queen went full monarch, look at her there, to open Parliament in a white dress by her go-to designer Angela Kelly and an ermine cape. She paired it with her diamond coronation necklace and George IV state diadem crown. Worth more than us, I'm sure. OK, Brittany, we have to talk about Kate's outfit first. Stepping off the plane, my goodness, I had to catch my breath. Yeah, perfection. You can tell she's put a lot of thought into this tour wardrobe. From the second she stepped off that plane, this gorgeous, bespoke Catherine Walker look, 
ombre. It's bringing in beautiful trends, beautiful color. And she's paying, you know, homage to the culture there. She's wearing kind of her own take on the shawar kameez. So she has the pants and she has this beautiful tunic top. But, yeah. you know, she worked and collaborated with a designer she knows well and created just this stunning moment. And the color, everything was beautiful. That one is not available in Yeah, stores, that's not available. So when you're a royal, yeah. you get to get some beautiful uh -huh. bespoke custom, you know, dresses for you. So she was yeah. really kind of thinking about this tour. I think this had a lot of, you know, there's some packing required here. There's a lot of uh, forethought to put together a tour wardrobe for sure. And the ombre is really fun. Seeing that trend, I don't think we've seen a lot of that. Like that gradient, you know, the beautiful different shades of blue was beautiful. She really looked like she was glowing. She mm -hmm. has been glowing. I don't know if it's the, the bright colors that yeah. are really bringing that out. She looks incredible. She's really leaning into the colors. She also paired this look with Zine Accessories, which is a Pakistani designer. So she's still, you know, she's she's mixing that in and she's just really thinking about crafting these beautiful, you know, looks. Now this outfit brings back memories of Princess Diana's time in Pakistan mm -hmm. as well, doesn't it? Yeah, she wore a very similar look in the 90s. Yeah. So it was very, um, I think that was something that probably they were thought they thought about as well you know Diana did so much work there and they're you know going to continue that legacy so I think that was a really special nod to wear the similar color for sure paying tribute mm -hmm. yeah so many stunning looks to choose from this week which is your fave I can't even I can't even decide it's mine it's so hard but I'm going to switch gears a little bit and go with Megan you are I okay am. Megan stepped out and she wore that beautiful green Perroche dress yes. and what I love about this is a rewear and she wore this dress for her engagement photos yeah. to Prince Harry. So it was really special to bring back something like that a year after, right? She's like really seeing, rocking the rewear. She's re really rocking she? the rewear. And this dress is a little bit more expensive. It's sold out, unfortunately, but it's a little bit more expensive. So, you know, she's making use of these kind of forever pieces in her closet. She paired it with a beautiful camel centaur coat. Yeah. Which is another like kind of cornerstone of her wardrobe, these great coats. That coat is fifteen hundred dollars, so definitely more wow. pricey, but yeah. she's getting a lot of wear out of it, right? She has these investment pieces, but she's wearing them again and again. Yeah. Great Manola Blahnik heels, a really cool bag, a scarf bag that's sold out already. She's really that's cool. Yeah. Always. So she's having <laughs> some fun with her accessories as well. But I just thought it was a really special moment, a great fall outfit, yeah. great color palette, her hair. <laughs> Everything. And that she day, just, it was it was all about green. It was Kate all about was wearing green. green on that same day. Yeah, because green in Pakistan, she was honoring the color there. Yeah. It's in their flag. So yeah, it's really it's a special. It's special. They looked great. Yeah, they both always. Always. Do. <laughs> yeah. Now, lastly, I didn't mention this in the recap, but we have to show the boys some love, don't we? Will's look at the event at the Pakistan National Monument on Tuesday. Brittany, he's not wearing a suit. No. Not the traditional type of suit, at least. No, he's also, you know, he's paying tribute to where he is. He's wearing a Sherwani. So he's wearing this tunic top. He's not wearing a suit. He's honoring the culture. You know, he's showing how serious he's taking his duties there as well, which I think, you know, he, they're, they're, they're the next royals there. They're really taking their job and the next step seriously and you can see that through their wardrobe for and sure. And he looked great didn't he? He, he looked, looked so handsome, he looked comfortable, he owned Coming it. Out the rickshaw. You know it was really it was a special moment and I love that they had a matchy matchy couple oh, moment as well and that beautiful yeah the greens are gorgeous. It was picture perfect. Picture perfect. Now speaking of Meghan Markle looking gorgeous uh, did you hear we had a longtime friend and makeup artist here this week. Daniel Martin. Daniel he's Martin. He's a celebrity. You got it. He's he a celebrity really around here, I will say. Yeah. He's so lovely. He's amazing. He really mm. was. Uh, and he stopped by on Monday to share some of his best office beauty tips. Take a look. Hey guys, I am here with celebrity makeup artist and beauty expert Daniel Martin is with us. Daniel has a whole slew of celebrity clients from Jessica Alba to Jessica Biel to Elizabeth Moss to Nina Dobrev. The whole of Hollywood basically, <laughs> by the sounds of things. But perhaps most exciting to us, he is the longtime makeup artist and dear friend of Meghan Markle herself. Daniel, thank you so much for being here. We're so excited to have Thanks you. Thanks for having me, I'm excited. Of course, you're most famously known for creating the beauty look of the decade. Wow. Megan's <laughs> wedding look. Yeah, um, I, I, she gave me this incredible gift and I just wanted to make her look and feel as beautiful as she can. And um, I feel like, I feel completely honored that I was able to provide that for her. Well, today you're actually going to show us how to achieve the perfect beauty look 
for The Office, yes. which is going to be really interesting. Yes. This dress, I'm sure you recognize it. It's from Megan's collection yes. to benefit smart work. It looks gorgeous on you. Thank and what you. I think is really great about this collection is that you can actually wear it outside of work. All right. I'm ready. I'm Are you ready. ready? Totally. Let's do it. So Daniel, this is Jillian, our model for today. And Jillian, I'm sure you recognize this shirt as mm -hmm. well from Megan's line with Smartworks. This is the collaboration between Megan and Misha Nunu, her BFF. Uh, what are your plans for Jillian today? Oh gosh, with Jillian, she has such beautiful fair skin. I really want to like pull out those rosy cheeks. I really want to open up her eyes a bit. Using like a mascara as a liquid liner and using your lip on your cheek. Just something that will give you that flexibility without feeling like you have to have more makeup in your bag. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna hydrate your lips a bit. This is an incredible lip mask. I've kind of set your complexion. I'm gonna do powder last because I really want your skin to accept what I've just put on top of it. And I really want your radiance to come through. So I'm just gonna go into your eyes now. Now I'm gonna go into your cheek, but this is also gonna be your lipstick. I'm going for like this rosy kind of mauve lip color. So you're ready to see what we did? Oh my God, you look amazing. Thank you. Flawless, but so natural yeah, at the same time. Totally. I love that, really fresh face. These were very easy steps. It takes no time to do once you figure it out. But then it's really important to understand the multi-functioning of each product that you could eventually do. Well, now it's my turn. Yay. Yay. What are your plans for me today? I feel like I'm gonna show you how to kind of like refresh your makeup. Maybe, you know, after work, you're gonna go out for drinks. So this is a nice way to kind of like play up what you can do with your makeup to kind of like spice it up a bit for evening. But I feel like not stray away too much from what you came in with. Okay. But just to kind of like finesse everything and make it more polished for night. Okay, perfect. Sound good? Let's do it. Awesome. What's first? So first, I'm going to just refresh your makeup with this uh, dewy mist spray. And it's just gonna just help your makeup kinda kind of get everything going, make everything a bit softer. Feels very refreshing. Yeah, so three o'clock comes around, this is what you definitely yeah. wanna do with your makeup. That will wake you up and get you ready for Completely. that meeting with your boss. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? <laughs> God, your skin is so beautiful. Oh, thank you. Okay, great. So I'm gonna mix a bit of concealer with a bit of foundation. Okay. And I like to do this because what it does is the concealer tends to be a bit um, more full coverage. Yeah. And having just foundation close by just kind of makes everything a bit softer, but you still get that coverage that you want. Okay, so a good medium coverage is that exactly. What we're and this okay. is how much I'm using. Oh, that's just a it. Little bit. Yep. Oh wow. Yeah. So a little goes a long way here. Exactly. Because I'm also playing off of what you already have, yeah. and this is just gonna brighten you up and just clean you up just a bit. So again, I like to start in the center of the face and work out. Take that up a bit. So that's the trick, and brushes are important, aren't they? Yeah, I like to have a couple of brushes. If you're at, you know, at your desk, definitely something, a multifunctional brush would be nice. This actually is an eyeshadow brush, but I like to use it on the face as a buffing brush. So you do a lot of sort of interesting things like switching up uh, the use of makeup and brushes. Absolutely, because I think for an artist, you I have to think of my environment. I have to think about um, the kind of makeup that I'm doing. So sometimes it could be too much to have like a brush for one thing. So I like to find things that I can multi-use so it minimizes a lot of stuff. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take this gorgeous gold. Oh, I love that. And I wanna play around on your eyelid with it. Okay. Because it's really gonna pull a lot of the green that's in your eye okay. out. Yeah. So that's interesting, gold can work for work. Yeah. yeah. If you're someone who likes the contour, I can definitely show you how to like incorporate that so it doesn't look too dramatic. I like a little a contour, yeah. A little um, contour can be fun. So much of it is about um, just creating a bit more strength. So what I'm also gonna do is I'm gonna, some people contour and then highlight. Okay. I'm actually gonna highlight first. Okay. And by doing this, this enables me to see where light hits your face and then work around that. You know I have to ask you, you are the man behind the look of the century, right? Really? Yeah, the beauty look of the century. The look that you have created with Megan is so natural. I mean, first rule of thumb was 
she never likes her her freckles covered. Also too, she was in the procession outside for like an hour in the church, getting to the church in the car. Like I had to think of all these different lighting scenarios. So I kept her skin really minimal. Um, literally, it was just like, like a lot of hydration, minimal coverage, a little bit of foundation, a little bit of concealer, but I just really wanted her skin to come through. And then there's that moment when you see H pull her veil off and you see her, that's what every girl wants on their wedding it's what day. what everyone wants. So I feel like everybody, whether you're a royal or your mom, you're all in the same boat. So it's just finding products that work really well for you that you can easily task so you're not having to spend so much time on your makeup. All right, take a look. Okay, the moment of truth. Yes. <laughs> oh wow, I love it. So natural and so flawless. And then this is easy for you to take from the office to your night Absolutely, out. yeah, this, this goes both places. Awesome. It goes there well. Yes. Daniel, you are amazing, you oh, are thanks. so awesome. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you so for, much. Thank you for having Jillian me. looks amazing, I look amazing. We appreciate it. Thank you. You're this the best. Good. Thank you. How cool was that, Brittany? That was so cool. What was he like in person? So sweet and humble, considering he works with the most famous woman in the world. He truly does. Yeah, amazing. And he also has great beauty tips, obviously. One of the things he shared that we didn't have time for in the piece was his top five must-haves at the office. These are the five things every woman should have at her desk listening Brittany yeah. a mist spray atomizer to help refresh your makeup throughout the day and refresh you uh, block papers to get rid of the shine after you were sweating over that deadline a bag of no-brainer lipsticks all your favorite shades from neutral pink to red whatever works for you and whatever you're comfortable with mascara is a must of course and finally he says keep an open mind and don't be afraid to be adventurous you're allowed to try new things even at the office Brittany, did he leave anything out, do you think? No, I mean, I'm gonna make sure I have all those things at my desk as soon as I leave here. I know, <laughs> I packed mine together already. I know, I'm ready. <laughs> I love him, I adore him, I'm so excited. Gotta have a touch up at work. Always, as well, right? always a nice lip touch up, a nice nudie lip. Definitely. Well, it's time for another break, but when we return, we'll be taking a closer look at Princess Diana's humanitarian impact in Pakistan. Welcome back to the Royal Report. As we mentioned earlier, William and Kate just visited Shalkat Khan and Memorial Cancer Hospital, a hospital that may not exist today if it wasn't for Princess Diana and her humanitarian efforts back when the facility first opened in the 90s. This next segment celebrates the People's Princess and her time in Pakistan. In 1991, Diana celebrated the 10th anniversary of her fairy tale wedding. That September, the 30 year old princess traveled to Pakistan for the first time. The three day trip was also her first official solo tour as a royal. It was significant for so many reasons. Here she is standing on her own. She's so very, very, very far from home. But Pakistan, interestingly, was a place that Diana was drawn to at several points throughout her life. And when she visited the first time, she really put a focus on some of the issues that mattered a lot to her. This was an official royal tour, but like Diana was known to, to do, she put a humanitarian spin on it. She wanted to get close to the people of Pakistan. She wanted to shine a light on causes that were important to her, drug abuse and homelessness. It was homelessness, it was, it was children, it was babies, it was the people of Pakistan, and it was her opportunity solo to really embrace that and make a difference, which she did. Days one and two, Diana spent visiting a family welfare center in Islamabad, along with a mosque and a women's college in Lahore. On her third and final day, she traveled northwest to the Khyber Pass to meet with military personnel. I think it was important for her to do her solo trip because when she did trips with Charles, she always came across as very shy and very demure, and she was slightly more in that royal role of being his wife and slightly standing back. And this was such an important thing for her because it really showed that actually she was a very strong woman. She actually had a real core to her. She could handle it solo. She could go, she could make an impact, she could make a difference, and she could handle it. 
Five years later, in February 1996, Diana returned to Lahore to attend a fundraising event for the largest cancer hospital in Pakistan. The facility was recently opened by Diana's good friend, former cricket champion and national hero, Imran Khan. I'm sad that the visit is being termed as political. The fact is that it is, this hospital is not political. Treating poor patients free in a third world country, a modern cancer institute, that's not political. Diana had long been passionate about fighting cancer and helping children. So we had seen her make several of these trips around the world for this cause in recent months. Diana is in a period in her life when she is in a lot of personal turmoil. She's kind of careening toward the final stages of her marriage. And one thing Diana really made clear throughout her life was no matter what hurdles, curveballs, scandals, controversies were thrown her way, that was never going to stop her from doing the good work that filled her up. So I think by traveling to Pakistan when she did in the midst of all of that misery, she really made the point, I'm still doing what I care about, I'm still helping people in need. And Imran Khan, who was a close friend of hers, he's a very clever man for taking her there because to take her to a fundraiser there for this new hospital that had opened for cancer, I don't think they could have believed how that would have affected the fundraising. It was an incredible moment. If you had Diana's name attached to it, it just took things to another level. Mum, would you say a few words about the visit? Right here. No, because I've only just arrived, so I haven't seen anything. Okay. Diana was back in Pakistan the following year, once again to raise money for Imran Khan's hospital. This is the only private cancer hospital in the world that treats 80% of its patients free. That was a place she wanted to go. She loved the Pakistani people. She loved that project. I think she really just wanted to make an impact. Her coming here and launching this fund means we have a chance of collecting our $25 million. It gives us public relationing profile, we were able to, because of her, invite the top donors in this country, which we wouldn't have got normally. In addition to increasing awareness for the Children's Hospital and bringing in donors, she also spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the patients and with the children. That was really quintessential Diana. I saw her firsthand with children, with sick children, dying children, terminally ill children. She was incredible. She had a real passion for it. There's a very big difference between duty and passion. And I think Diana had the passion to do things. This was Diana's last trip to Pakistan. Three months later, she was gone. Diana's impact on Pakistan is really something special, and her legacy there remains really strong. She's really beloved for the light she was able to shine there, and the places that she visited are still benefiting from Diana's magic. The Royal Report will be right back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Joining me now is a huge fan of royal fashion, and she doesn't just admire it. Oh, no, she slaves in it herself. And you can follow her on Instagram at Royally Inspired. Say hello to Sharon Jones. Sharon, it's so good to see you. Two Sharons under one roof. Yes. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Good. We're super excited to chat with you. You are what is known as a replicator. What does that mean exactly? So a replicator is someone who loves royal fashion and doesn't just like to look at it, but also likes to wear it, um, either to get the same pieces that the royals wear or pieces that are similar, a replica, if you will, um, hence the name replicator. Yeah, the, the, with the Kate in there, right? Exactly. Yep. <laughs> Not just by chance. Now, sometimes you find the exact look to replicate and sometimes you take inspiration from their looks and make it your own. How do you decide which to do, which direction to go in? Well, it depends on the piece. If it's a piece that they're wearing that's um, you know currently available in the stores and affordable, then I would go for that exact piece because it's really nice to actually know that you have the same exact item yeah. you know, as one of them. Um, if the item is old or if it's really expensive or custom, then I would try to find something that, that I think gives a similar impression. Yeah, you're doing a fabulous job. Now talk to us a little bit about this outfit you're wearing right now. I've seen this outfit yes. before. Yes. <laughs> Megan. Yes, yeah. so Megan wore this on the first day of her South Africa tour. And as soon as I saw it, I just loved it. I thought it's beautiful. The, it's beautiful. The print is really special. 
um, because it's black and white, it's not too bright. I could wear it, I could wear it to the office, I could wear it around my neighborhood on the weekends. I just thought it was a very versatile piece and I wanted it. Now, is this your career or a passion for you? Oh, it's a passion for me. I have to have a career to afford the passion. <laughs> <laughs> and there are a lot of replicators out there. There are, but um, I haven't met any in New York City yet, actually. Okay. Maybe after this. Yeah. All right, well, that was so much fun. Uh, I'm sure you must follow all the royals on social, right, to see what they're wearing. Yes. yes. So you're going to love this, because now it's time for the Social Media Minutes. Hi, Sharon. This week, every royal account was posting, so fitting this into one minute posed quite a challenge. But Big Ben's ready, so let's get started. On Friday, the Sussex Royal page posted a video in honor of International Day of the Girl. In addition to showing images from their recent time in Africa, the video also included an interview with a young Meghan encouraging people to speak out. This video is so moving, and it's great to see Meghan inspiring girls of all ages to make an impact. On Saturday, Princess Eugenie celebrated her one-year wedding anniversary by posting a new video to her Instagram. We got to see awesome behind-the-scenes footage of the big day, and I love getting to see her dress in even more detail. It is stunning. On Tuesday, the Royal Family's Instagram page honored Westminster Abbey turning 750 by posting these iconic photos. So cool to throw back to the Queen's coronation in 1953 and her wedding to Prince Philip in 1947. And finally, last Thursday, Prince Harry posted a video with Ed Sheeran to the Sussex Royal page in honor of World Mental Health Day. While Ed did highlight that they both have red hair, they also encouraged people to share their feelings with others. That's your Social Media Minute for this week. Back to you, Sharon. That video was so funny, Ed Sheeran and Prince Harry. Thank you so much, Gillian. That was our social media correspondent, Gillian Fleischman. Such a great week for royal posts, right? Sharon, did any posts this week catch your eye? Um, actually, yes, one did. Which one? It was the one of Kate and William arriving in Pakistan at the beginning of their tour. Oh, the dress. Are you going to get that dress. dress or a replicate of the dress? I don't know. I'm going to have to look around and see if I can see something that's worthy. It's going to be a little trickier, right, with the ombre effects. I think so. Beautiful. Yeah, I love that. Mine was a little outside of this week, uh, but it's just too cute not to mention. Did you see George at the Aston Villa soccer game last week, or should I say football? Uh, he is growing up quickly. How sweet was it to see him as a super fan? Look at him. So excited. He's so cute. It was really, it was great. He's really cute. It's a shame he's not a Watford fan. I'm a Watford fan. Okay, well, we have to take one last break, but we'll be right back with This Week in Royal History. Welcome back to the Royal Report. Sharon Joan is still here with us. And now it's time for this week in Royal History. <laughs> On October 13th, 2016, King Fumi Fon the Great of Thailand died at the age of 88, which meant Queen Elizabeth II instantly became the world's longest reigning living monarch. King Fumifon had ascended the throne in 1946 at the age of 18, and by the time of his death, he had ruled for 70 years, four months, and four days. Queen Elizabeth II began her reign in 1952 when she was 25 years old and had been ruling for 64 years, eight months, and seven days when Fumifon passed her the torch as the world's longest living monarch. God save the queen. Not only is Queen Elizabeth the longest reigning living monarch, she's also the longest reigning female monarch of all time, living or dead. And during her 67 year reign so far, the Queen has met with 11 American presidents. She actually did miss out on meeting one president though. Sharon, can you guess who that was? Which uh, president does she not get to meet? I don't know, Ronald Reagan, <laughs> Ronald Reagan. I think a lot of people don't know. It's Lyndon B. Johnson, actually. So there's a, a fun fact for you there. President Johnson didn't travel to England during his presidency, and the Queen would have met him at President JFK's funeral, but she was unable to attend because she was pregnant with her youngest son, Prince Edward. Thank you so much for being here with us, Sharon. We absolutely loved 
having you. You look fab and we'll be following you on Insta. That's for so sure. Much. All right, that's all we have time for. I want to thank the adorable Lady Breadloaf here, who's kind of sleeping right now. Wake up, wake up. Uh, thank you, Breadloaf, for helping me break down what has been a truly thrilling week for Royal Watchers. You can check her out at Breadloaf Corgi on Insta. Okay, it's a really fun Insta account. And remember to follow people on Twitter to watch the newest episode of The Royal Report streaming every Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sharon Carpenter. Ta-ta till next time.